Morning. Today we're going to be going over 10 foods that you should avoid during a detox. These are foods that I make sure that when I'm focusing on liver detox and reducing my sugar cravings that I avoid these foods. Some of them are a little obvious, but some are not as obvious. So I wanted to make sure to highlight a bunch of different categories of foods I've gotten questions of um, in the past so you guys know which foods are going to support your goals during a detox and which ones won't. Um, I actually do have a previous live stream on some of the best foods to incorporate during a detox to, to support liver detox. So if you guys want to check that out, it's from a couple months ago. But today we're just diving into the 10 foods that you absolutely need to make sure you're avoiding. Otherwise, it's like no point in using a detox. <laughs> okay. So today we are actually starting the seven day detox. If you guys want to join in, I have the details linked down description below. It is an amazing way to just kind of kickstart your goals and to help just feel good again. So I've talked a lot about some of the other AM peeps in the past, like Jeanette is one of her favorite programs. She's used um, all of my various programs in the past, but she always goes back to the detox after like a holiday or if she's had a little bit more sugar just so she can get her body feeling really great again. Here's some of the other AM peeps talking about that. Sarah at the top left um, mentioned only one week, less bloat, zero cravings, crazy energy, better sleep, and four pounds gone. Catherine at the bottom right talking about how the detox really helped to support her anxiety goals, improving some of those aspects as well. So there's a lot of reasons why you might want to incorporate some type of detox. And I know there's a lot of like fluff around that word. We're talking about a true liver detox, how the body is always detoxing, but we want to be able to support it and, and allow it to do its job better. So when we are constantly eating the types of foods or toxins that don't support our goals, um, it can really clog up the liver because the liver has to break them down. Our liver, just like any machine, can only tolerate so much work at one time. So when we have a lot of toxins coming in, if it, if it maxes out on the capacity on what our body is actually able to process, it's just going to end up storing it on the outside of the liver as fatty deposits to then deal with at a later date. So we often um, think of like alcohol as a toxin. We know that. Or like even caffeine can um, be something that needs to be broken down by the liver. There's a lot of things that I think people don't realize need to be broken down by the liver that we're going to be getting into today that just absolutely are not going to support the liver breaking down those old toxins that are on the outside of it. So let's dive into some of those. So if you guys are just joining in, we're going into 10 foods that are absolutely things you should not be eating during a detox, especially the seven-day detox, which we're starting today. So if you guys want to join in, just grab the details for the seven-day detox program. Link down description below. It should be, I think, the first line on there. We have AM peeps all around the world joining in. It's always a great just place to start off and kick off your wellness goals so you can also help with the sugar cravings aspect as well. Okay. So this first one are jams and jellies. Now, let me just make this a little bigger for you guys so you can see it. All right. So something that jams and jellies have, or, or traditional jams and jellies rather, are fruit and sugar. So it has both fruit and sugar in there. Typically, the way you make jam or jelly is by like cooking down strawberries and adding in sugar and then letting it sit. That's like the main way that you make it. And what these both have in common, both the fruit and just regular sugar, is that it's going to be pretty high in fructose. So sugar, just regular old sugar, um, contains both glucose and fructose. Now, remember, we talked about um, how there's certain foods and things that need to be broken down by the liver. And if we eat too much of them, it can clog up the liver, uh, just make it not function as great. Fructose is actually one of those. Fructose is a, our fr it's a, a fruit sugar. So it's the... Um, not necessarily only found in fruit, it's found in a lot of other things, but we commonly know it as the fruit sugar. So fructose is one that needs to be broken down by the liver. We cannot use it as energy until the liver breaks it down, converts it. And so if we eat too much of it, it's just going to clog up the liver, cause some of those fatty deposits. It's actually a, some really interesting research on higher fructose intakes leading to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's from that um, fat deposits being uh, stored there on the outside from eating too much of these foods that the liver has to break down. So during a um, seven-day detox, especially uh, like what we're doing right now, we want to make sure we're getting that clean slate. As I mentioned, the liver is always detoxing. Like we are not causing detox <laughs> during the seven day detox. We're just making it so that the liver can have a clean slate so it doesn't have to process more of what's coming in and can help to deal with what was already there. 
So the next thing we want to avoid during a seven day detox are sugar sweetened coffees and teas. So this is one, if you've watched my channel for over the years, you know, I always go back to this because it is something that I see everybody drinks and just don't realize that there's sugar in it, or they just don't realize how impactful that sugar is. So like vanilla latte or a mocha, you know, all of those are going to have a lot of sugar, typically even a matcha latte. If you get it from just a regular coffee shop and you're not making it at home, it's usually going to have a significant amount of added sugar. And remember sugar is made up of both glucose and fructose. Fructose is the one that needs to be broken down by the liver. And that means we need to limit that. Um, at least, you know, really focus on those added sources of fructose, really greatly limiting those so that the liver can just better, more efficiently process some of those older toxins. As uh, I put on here, stevia and monk fruit can be okay. In terms of liver detox, these ones won't affect actual liver detox. Um, but in the seven day detox, you'll see that I do recommend even staying away from some of these if you do really struggle with sugar cravings. So you want to make sure that you're just getting that clean slate again. Um, oh, thank you so much. We have a super chat here. You look so healthy and beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So then we have the chocolate as the next one. So this is one that can be a little, not as black and white. There's a gray area here, which is why I wanted to bring it up because if you guys have my seven day detox, you've seen that it, within the seven day detox, actually cacao is a great food source to be having during the detox because it is really rich in antioxidants. It's actually really rich in fiber, which is so important during phase three liver detox. Um, but process just regular chocolate, like a chocolate bar that you're going to get from the grocery store, even if it's dark chocolate, typically there's going to be added sugar in there. So it's not the cacao, like the actual chocolate portion, that's the problem. It's just the fact that chocolate has added sugar. And as you'll recall, sugar is half of, or is made up um, partly of fructose. So half of it is fructose. And the fructose is the thing that we really need to be limiting and watching out for. Okay. And then Next one we have our most baked goods. So this is, there's a couple of reasons why for most baked goods, why you'll want to avoid these, even like the healthier baked goods. I know, um, you know, back when I lived in LA, there are a lot of really cool, trendy, healthier coffee shops that would have these healthy baked goods that always seemed like so healthy for lack of a better word. They had this halo over them that made it seem like, oh, it's made from like, gluten-free flour and it uses honey instead of just regular cane sugar, they still have added sugar and typically it's still going to have a processed flour. So from a sugar uh, standpoint, even like these healthier baked good items, you want to not incorporate during a detox because of the sugar, because we know that contains fructose. Um, certain sugars have a lot more, as you'll see when we get into in a second. Um, but that's one of the main things you need to look for with the even the healthier baked good items. But for like traditional or rather conventional um, baked goods, like if you were to go to any other type of bakery or if you were to go to like Costco and get those big things of like blueberry muffins, I don't even know if they sell those anymore. I just remember as a kid, that was something that we definitely had were like those big trays of blueberry muffins. Uh, those are going to have a significant amount of trans fats. So trans fats have actually been found to lead to liver disease and scarring. So since the liver is where these toxins are being processed, you want to make sure it's in the healthiest state possible and eating foods that can possibly cause liver damage and scarring is only going to make the liver more unable to process those toxins. So most baked goods, the slight caveat is if you're to have like something made with almond flour purely and exclusively, and it didn't have any sugar. So like a protein pancake could be a good example where if you're making a protein pancake with protein powder and even like a small amount of banana where the fructose content isn't too high, that is not going to overwhelm the liver. Um, but traditional baked goods that use traditional flours, trans fats, and sugars, those are things that we want to avoid during the detox. Okay, number five we have, and this is where we get into, I think like kind of the trickier area that can that can be a little confusing for some people, and it's agave nectar. Whoever did the marketing for naming agave nectar should get like the absolute biggest gold star because nectar just makes it seem so healthy. It makes it seem like you went to agave plant, just like tapped on it, and then just the agave nectar was spilling out in like this glorious, healthy 
sweetness. <laughs> That's not what happens. It's actually a really processed food item. Um, so nectar makes it seem like it's really unprocessed. It's not. It's actually a very processed food. It's pr it's processed in a similar way to just high fructose corn syrup. And in fact, ironically, it's actually typically even higher in fructose than just regular high fructose corn syrup. So a lot of people have agave nectar in their pantries, using it in baked goods or using it in um, different food items, thinking that it's like a healthier item, but it's really not. It, it's very high in fructose. It's going to have that same impact um, of really overloading the liver with that fructose content, especially if you're using a lot of it. And it's just an added sugar anyway. So it's another one we'll want to stay away from. In the seven day detox, you guys see that we're just in general staying away from added sugars, but I definitely wanted to highlight agave nectar specifically because it's one that I think can kind of sneak under the radar. And it's uh, one that people don't realize is so high in fructose and so highly processed. Okay, next up we have our chips and crackers. So these aren't necessarily high in fructose. They aren't, I mean, they probably have trans fats. That's the biggest thing with most chips and crackers. There's probably some type of trans fats that could cause some liver scarring, especially eaten on a continuous basis. My biggest concern is actually how it will impact your seven day detox results. So they are very, chips and crackers across the board are very high glycemic load. Now, in a lot of my recent videos, especially if you guys tuned in for my sugar detox series, you saw me talk a lot about glycemic load and how that can affect our blood sugar levels and how that can really drive more sugar cravings. Now, seeing that one of the main food items um, that can clog up the liver from a dietary perspective, at least, uh, being fructose, being something that's half of sucrose or just regular sugar, we really don't want to have those sugar cravings spiked because otherwise it's just going to make the detox really difficult to maintain because you're just riding this blood sugar roller coaster and constantly craving these sugars that work against detox goals, weight loss goals, wellness goals. So chips and crackers are things that can cause more of that roller coaster ride because of the huge glycemic load they have um, and just make the whole detox experience a lot more difficult. So for that reason, uh, chips and crackers are things that I definitely do not re recommend really eating on a daily basis. If you're going out to eat and it's non-detox, it's non-challenge time, and it's like one of your treat meal items that you love and you want chips and guac, that's something entirely different. But during this more dedicated time where you're focused on your health and wellness goals, these are not going to support them. Okay, next up, the one that we knew had to be on this list <laughs> if we were talking about detox and it's all alcohol. I don't care like how clean it is, how pure, like all alcohol across the board. And this is because it does require liver processing. No matter what type of alcohol it is, the liver has to break it down. And we're looking for this clean slate effect. We want the liver to be able to not have to uh, take in even more of these toxins that it has to break down so that it in instead can focus its attention and dedicate its time to really focusing on these older toxins that are maybe um, on the outside of the liver. And this, I, this one's a little heftier of a uh, slide because I wanted to highlight this specifically on how quickly these fatty deposits can occur. Um, I actually re remember first learning this in college and this made me like <laughs> definitely stop drinking alcohol for a very long time after I learned this. Um, but on here, you can see, obviously, we know excessive alcohol consumption can cause those fatty deposits. So the fat deposits, remember, is your liver just uh, taking those toxins, putting them on the outside of the liver and storing them as fat until it can deal with them at a later date because it's just it clogged up and it's it doesn't have time to get to it. Um, but something that can be a little scary is that this fatty liver deposits can actually develop after even just one to two nights of heavier drinking, which is categorized, if you can see on the slide, as four to five drinks in two hours or less. For some people, that might sound like a lot. Like for me, that sounds like a lot of alcohol. But for other people, that's you know not a ton of alcohol. It might be kind of surprising to hear that these fatty deposits can occur even just after one night or two nights of four to five drinks within a two-hour period. If this is you like, you know, every Saturday or Sunday night, then this is something to consider because you can see the impact it is having on the liver directly every single time this is happening. And especially if you pair this with alcohol and then having the chips that maybe are going along with those um, later night like drinking activities and then the sugar that also is clogging up the liver, it all compounds on each other. 
and makes it so we just build up on these fatty deposits that eventually, um, if these aren't addressed, can lead to something like fatty liver disease, which eventually can lead to uh, cirrhosis, which is irreversible. Before cirrhosis, a lot of this is irreversible. Um, I put on here that thankfully, once you stop drinking and allow your liver to process the ethanol, the fatty liver steatosis has been noted to be highly reversible. So that's very good news. But you want to get to it before it becomes one of those irreversible problems where the liver just is permanently scarred and can't deal with those toxins in the same way. So as I put on here again, the detox focus is to reduce that toxic load to allow the liver to process those old toxins. So it's not that any one of any single one of these is necessarily bad on its own. It's especially the fact that there's this toxic load and buildup that can occur when you have the fructose, the sugar, the trans fats, and the alcohol all building up on one another um, and having these on a consistent basis, even in small amounts, but from each of these categories can really cause some serious damage. Okay. Next up, we have most fried food. Now, I put most fried food on here because it's specifically the trans fats that are the problem. We talked earlier in this live stream, live stream about how trans fats can cause some of that liver scarring. Now, not all uh, fried food is actually cooked in trans fats. So that is something where if you were to have like, like if you were to um, do some type of frying at home, but using a more saturated fat that doesn't have trans fats, that actually is a much more stable product. And especially for the long term after the detox, it's a much better way to go about it. So like using coconut oil, for example, is a better option. I actually think I have a blog post on the better options if you are going to use some type of frying methods that don't contain trans fats that are better. Um, I believe I do. If I do, I'll link it down below after this live stream. But if not, I'm going to do a blog post on that because that's important. But you could do instead of frying, especially during the detox, is just baking. Even air frying can be a better option. It's just really the trans fat component within most fried foods. Like obviously I have on here, um, looks like French fries, I think, but like really fried French fries uh, and calamari, like any type of food that's typically fried, um, especially if you're going out to eat, is probably fried in some type of trans fat. And those are the foods that can cause some of those liver scarring that you want to avoid. So baking is a better option, um, roasting, steaming, sauteing, and making sure that you're cooking with some type of more uh, heat stable item, not the vegetable oils that, are, that tend to be really high in saturated or in uh, trans fats. The saturated fats are actually the more stable ones. Ironically, because a lot of people were scared of them for a long time. Okay, next up we have bread and bagels. This is similar to the chips and crackers concern, where it's not necessarily going to clog up the liver. There are some issues where, you know, just eating higher um, carbohydrate intake could cause some potential liver issues. But it's more so the fact that you get these more, the blood sugar spikes and falls. Bread and bagels, very high glycemic load. If you guys aren't familiar with the glycemic load versus glycemic index. So the glycemic index is one you probably heard more about. It's actually kind of a useless measurement unless you use glycemic load along with it. So glycemic load actually accounts for how much of these foods you're eating. Glycemic index does not. Um, and for a typical serving of bread and bagels, the glycemic load for bread and bagels is about 30 to 40. Anything above 20 is considered high. So these are very, very, very high glycemic load foods um, that causes big blood sugar spikes and falls, can cause more hunger, cause more cravings, and ultimately make it harder um, to maintain that detox progress and maintain the lower sugar intake to help the body then process those older toxins. And then last up, we have soda and sports drinks. So these ones, my goodness, these are just sodas. <laughs> like I had been a long time since I had actually looked at um, just in the grocery store nutrition facts label for like Gatorade. And the other day, I think it was a couple months ago, I went to go check these out for a video or a short, I forget which one. And on the back of just these standard Gatorade bottles, like a 20 ounce one, it had 34 grams of sugar, which is the same amount as a Coca-Cola. So you're just drinking a non-bubbly soda. It's crazy. So there's, I know people are going to ask about like the non-sugar containing Gatorades. Usually those are using uh, like, the, I think it's called Gatorade Zero or some, I'm not picking on just Gatorade. This is pretty much just all sports drinks across the board. 
Uh, but usually what they're using is some type of artificial sweetener that either has to be broken down by the liver or can still potentially cause insulin resistance and then cause further wellness issues. So I recommend, especially during a detox, but just everyday life, sticking to water, coffee, sparkling water, tea. Um, if you do need to have some electrolyte replacement, salt, element, those are my two recommendations that are much better at actually getting the hydration without all of the sugar. Nobody needs to drink 34 grams, which is, what is that, about almost nine teaspoons of sugar. It's too much, too much. <laughs> Okay, so those are the main things to focus on making sure that you're not eating during a seven day detox. There's a lot of others that I go over obviously within the seven day detox, but I wanted to really focus on these ones because these are ones I see a lot of questions on within the YouTube community um, about like, oh, what about zero sugar Gatorade or what about jams or jellies, um, bread? Like I wanted to make sure to touch on all these common items that I've seen a lot of questions about. Uh, so you guys know like, okay, these are things that are not going to support detox goals and likely long-term wellness goals either. So the seven day detox um, is starting today. If you guys want to join in, it's not too late. You can check out the details for the seven day detox program down description below. Um, I definitely recommend you actually read through the intro, read through the beginning portion, not just dive into the meal plan. There's a lot of really great information on liver detox, Phase one, phase two, phase three detox, knowledge is power, knowing what types of foods support your goals, which won't is just going to help you with not just these next seven days, but also the whole lifetime ahead of you. So if you guys want to check that out, um, join in with the community that's going on right now. You can grab the details down description below for the seven day detox program. But for now, I'm going to go through and answer some questions and also drink some water because I always forget to drink water when I'm talking and then like I can't speak for the rest of the day. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Good morning, Juliana and Katie. Oh, wow, fantastic. Mia, you helped me because I lost a lot of weight in a short period of time. I wasn't sure how to control my hunger without feeling guilty but after watching your videos. You make me feel better. Thank you. That's amazing. Feeling better. I mean, obviously the weight loss is fantastic. That's what we talk a lot about on this channel, um, especially if you have a weight loss goal, but it's also the feeling better having control over your hunger where you're not hungry all the time. Those are huge, huge wellness perks where, you know, if you, you have to, in order to achieve a weight loss goal, be constantly hungry, be constantly weak, tired or being obsessed over like specific calorie trackers and calorie counting is not a way to live. <laughs> so to be able to actually not be hungry, support your goals and achieve those goals, it's a great feeling. So congratulations, Mia. Good morning, Mike and Guilen, another AM peep who shared her story. Actually, if you guys haven't seen her interview in the past, definitely check that out. Um, Guilen's made some amazing progress um, over the last year, roughly. So she's done really, really well. Okay. I'm not sure if this is a question. But Robin says, new here, just found your videos last week and started to incorporate intermittent fasting on Friday. So far, I feel great and I'm down 2.6 pounds. Last week, I would have said my goal is to lose at least 75 pounds. But now after watching many of your videos, my goal is body recomposition, losing fat and keeping gaining muscle. It's huge, so important because just looking at the scale doesn't tell you if you're losing muscle mass, if you're losing body fat, you could be losing bone. So body composition should always be the goal if weight loss is the goal because you don't want to have osteoporosis in the future. You don't want to have increased insulin resistance in the future and possibly type 2 diabetes because you lost muscle mass and bone uh, mass during the weight loss process. So it's great. Um, Robin said, my problem has always been that I've been hungry or not satisfied. So that meant I was constantly thinking about food, which meant I'd snack at night on things. Um, I shouldn't, it cut off. So I'm not sure if there's more to that, but yeah, those are much better goals. And the fact that, um, Robin's talking about snacking and hunger in the past, you know, those are typically a sign of not eating enough protein or eating too much sugar. I think it was in part two and three of the sugar detox series where I talk so much about this. So Robin, I know you're new here. Um, I just came out with a sugar detox series last two or three weeks. 
So check out parts two and three, or like the whole thing. Actually, it's five part series. Uh, it'll be quick for you to go through. Um, but especially parts two and three really go into the importance of the types of foods that support hunger, stable blood sugar levels, making sure that you don't feel hungry. Oh, Stephen, good morning, AM peeps. I'm excited for this detox this week, and we're getting some beautiful weather here in the Yukon this week. So I can't wait to get outside and get my steps in. I know it was so nice um, a couple days ago here, and then it, now it's like so misty here. It's like raining. It's crazy. But still going to get outside and get my steps in. Although I'm not sure if you guys notice, I have to take my Fitbit off when I'm um, doing my live streams because I wave my hands so much. I end up just getting like a thousand or two thousand steps just from talking. <laughs> Oh, Jennifer, love this video. Just received your protein powder in the mail yesterday as a Mother's Day gift and can't wait to try it. That's amazing. I'm so excited for you to try it out. Yeah, I also have a zero sugar protein powder if you guys want to check that out. I have an unflavored one as well as vanilla, chocolate. Chocolate is my personal favorite right now. Oh my gosh, the hot chocolate, the zero sugar hot chocolate that I make, so good. I uh, have that. I think I have it linked down description below. If not, you can find it on my website at autumnlnutrition.com forward slash shop. So autumn and then E-L-L-E nutrition.com. <laughs> Teresa also just received my seven day detox and unflavored whey protein. Little nervous. I love sugar, but I'm determined. You would be surprised by how easy one, not easy. The first few days of um, getting rid of sugar is always going to be more of a mental struggle with some physical struggles. There's definitely for some people, they experience headaches. That is pretty common, which is why hydrating, getting electrolytes is so important to help combat a lot of those feelings, getting adequate food, because if you're hungry, it's just going to cause really low blood sugar. So you don't want that. Um, making sure that you're just incorporating the foods that support those goals it makes it a lot easier than it might sound. So especially after you get over that three-day hump, you're going to be golden. <laughs> Alexa, I love your smoothies. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, it's a great question. Autumn, just had my checkup and first time my cholesterol is a bit high. Only thing I can think of is a switch to full fat dairy. How do I get my levels in check and enjoy my yogurt and cottage cheese? I would ask your doctor for a little bit more in-depth um, cholesterol reading first because just total cholesterol doesn't really say much. Uh, because HDL tends to go up really high, especially with the switch to more full fat. So HDL is more of the protective one, um, but also getting a better understanding of the type of LDL. So LDLP is a much better uh, indicator of overall heart health risk than just the regular calculated LDL. Uh, also A1C and triglycerides are super important to get just that full picture understanding before making really big changes. Because you want to make sure that whatever changes you're seeing aren't actually something that's necessarily bad um, because there are other factors that can outweigh some of these lesser tests. So you can ask your doctor, LDLP, ask about triglycerides, A1C, HDL. Um, if all that's the case, and if you are really sensitive to saturated fats, which there is about like maybe 10% of the population that is, then you could always experiment with not having full fat dairy. Um, but again, it's good to get a, a big picture idea first. Another really great test is the calcium artery score. It's kind of a much more intrusive test, but it is a, a really good one if you want to just check on where you're at in terms of heart health risk factors. Isabel, I want to purchase the seven day detox. We well, can find it. <laughs> Link down description below. <laughs> Oh, Laura, detoxing is exactly how I get back to my best eating after this past week's celebrations. Highly recommend Autumn's detox recipes because they set you up for success. Hello from Nantucket. Awesome. Yeah, Laura also shared her story in the past. She has an amazing story on my blog if you guys want to check that one out. Thank you, Laura. Juliana, thoughts on clear whey as a drink to add protein? I'm not sure if you mean like the whey... You get from making yogurt, which actually have that out. I can't see it right on that side because I need to make some yogurt today. Uh, you can add that. Absolutely. I'm not sure if Clear Whey is a brand though. Um, so if you're talking about the way that you get from making yogurt, you can use that to help boost your protein content a bit further. Um, that would be a good use of actually that extra whey that's um, being released from the yogurt. 
Mike, are essential amino acids okay? Yes. So essential amino acids are going to be in all complete proteins. I always recommend trying to just get them from complete proteins first. There can be a time and a place to use essential amino acids. So especially if you're training really hard, they can be useful. Um, but you want to make sure you're getting that full complex of, you know, you want all of the amino acids. <laughs> you want, of course, the essential amino acids that make it a complete protein, but you also want all of the others as well. So I just find sticking to more whole food options, you know, even like having a whey protein powder, like you talk about my protein powder, that's still a more whole food option than just the essential amino acids, because the essentials are taking, they're isolating it even further. I'm always more of an advocate of trying to get the whole food product first. So that could be whey protein powder if you want to use that and drink um, or smoothie. It could be beef, lamb, chicken, eggs, um, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese. If you are more plant-based, you could use something like tempeh or edamame, although those have a lower diet score. Um, but those are going to be still have the essential amino acids, especially the animal-based ones. You're still getting those um, from those sources. You just are also getting other amino acids too. Oh, Lisa, yay, I caught a live chat. Autumn, thank you so much for all your information and details video, detailed videos. I truly appreciate you. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah, Teresa, you're so right. The seven day detox has a lot of great information, is really guiding me in a good direction. The seven day detox, all, all of my programs, the first half of the programs, all contain so much information, so many useful tips. It goes into some science, but it's very accessible. So even if you don't have a science background, it is very easy to understand, very easy to apply. So it's so important that you read through the intro, read through the seven day detox. If you're going on to my other programs, like the 21 day intermittent fasting program, level up guide, um, make sure you always read the actual beginning portions. So much valuable information. So always, always read those. Won't take you a long time to read it, but you'll you will get so much out of reading those beginning portions of each program. Um, okay, couple, let's go through. I think I see some questions. I'm getting close to the bottom. <laughs> this is so interesting. Seals many. Have you heard of 72 hour eat sardines only challenge for cutting out carbs and sugar? I'm not. Um if you like sardines, you're getting protein and fat there. So, you know, you, you could do that. My one um, concern about this type of thing, you know, sardines actually very healthy, very great food item. You're going to get the fats and the um, proteins from there where technically, if you wanted to, you could just eat sardines, especially just for 72 hours and you'd probably be fine. In fact, you're getting a lot of DHA, EPA, really great stuff. But it's not really sustainable, obviously. You're not just going to only eat sardines all day for the rest of your life. I am a big advocate. I found the most success for applying the types of changes and having these reboots that actually are things you can then continue to apply onward and continue with life. <laughs> um, you don't have to just have 72 hours of, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner only eating sardines in order to achieve your goals. What I found is that type of dietary protocol or like fad diet um, can cause more of that yo-yoing effect where it's like, okay, I did a weekend over the Mother's Day weekend. I had a lot of chips, a lot of alcohol, a lot of treats. So I'm just going to do my 72 hours of a sardine fast. <laughs> I don't know if you'd call it that. Sardine like meals. Uh, it's just not, it's not a very sustainable long-term approach. It can cause more of that like yo-yoing effect, even though it's a much better option than like, let's say the cabbage soup diet it's still not something that is going to support you long-term and set you up with habits to support your success long-term either. So that's the only thing I have to say about that, but I've not heard of it until now. <laughs> okay, Bonnie, can we use your flavored protein powder during the detox? All the recipes have the unflavored in the recipes. Thank you for all you do. Have a blessed day. Oh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, so this goes back to what I talked about with the adding in um, like stevia or monk fruit. I only use 100% pure monk fruit in my protein powder. So it's zero sugar, but it does use monk fruit. If your goal is primarily just to focus on liver detox and getting rid of those excess toxins, then you can use a small amount of like monk fruit or stevia, um, especially if it's in something like protein powder, not adding it straight into a coffee. 
But if you are really struggling with sugar cravings, I'd recommend sticking with the unflavored so that you can just get a clean slate, get your taste buds to just readjust to this lower sugar intake so that you can then slowly add back in like the small amount of monk fruit that's in my flavored protein powders um, without it having to build upon and have a lot of a lot more sugar because your sugar cravings are so high still. So if your goal is both de- the liver detox um, focus and sugar cravings, then I'd recommend sticking with the unflavored. If not, then you can incorporate some of the monk fruit, but I would recommend just sticking to the protein powder so you don't overdo it. Kalissa, wait, I need some water, guys. <laughs> can you hear the scratchiness? <laughs> Um, I've been drinking bulletproof coffee and it hurts my stomach 30 minutes later, probably too much fat for you. So you can try either like I make a keto coffee that is a lot less fat than the typical bulletproof coffee. Usually bulletproof coffee will use like two tablespoons of butter and MCT oil, which can be a lot of fat for most people. Um, I use like about a half tablespoon of each, or you can use like, like, um, heavy cream up to a tablespoon of heavy cream or up to a tablespoon of half and half still get a lot of the same benefits or even just a small amount of MCT if you do want to use MCT. But typically that's why people experience like their stomach hurting after having it. It's because it's just a lot of fat. And if you aren't used to breaking down that fat, it's it's your um, gallbladder just trying to squeeze out and get out enough of the bile acid to break down that fat. And it's just not used to it. So it could just be making you feel queasy, make your stomach hurt as a result of that because you're not used to that much fat. So cutting down, using a lot less or sticking to like heavy cream, half and half, a little bit of MCT, like one one teaspoon, two teaspoons could still give you a lot of the same benefits, but without that stomach issue. I'm always bloated without anything. I have some great videos on bloating. I would really recommend if you just go on a YouTube type like Autumn Bates bloating. (laughs) you'll probably, they probably will all pop up. I have so many because this is something that I personally struggled with for so long, like really, really badly where after every time I would eat, I'd have to lay on my stomach because the bloating would be so bad, so uncomfortable. Um, I would, it would, my belly would be like further out than it is right now. And I'm six months pregnant right now. (laughs) So it's, Definitely something that can be very serious. You want to make sure that you focus on your gut health and making sure that you are um, addressing that. And there's a lot of really great tools for that. But just type Autumn Bates bloating on YouTube and you'll probably be able to come up with all my videos just from right there. I think I actually even have a playlist. So if you go onto YouTube in my playlist category, there might be a bloated, like bloated belly or bloating category. A lot of really great tools. Make sure you check those out. Rhonda. Smoothies are so much easier for me in the evening. Would you recommend veggie smoothies over fruit smoothies? I just came out with a blog post actually on how to construct a like dinner smoothie. Uh, That is like my step-by-step basis for what to do because you do want to make sure there's certain things you stay away from, certain things you're adding in to make it more applicable to dinner. So it's not going to keep you up. It's not going to make you too full right before bed. Uh, so check that out. Just type on to, you can type this on Google, Autumn Bates dinner smoothie. Um, it'll, my blog post for that should pop right up. If not, just go on my blog and scroll through and you should be able to find it. But I have my step-by-step details for that. Okay, I'm going to do a couple more questions here. Okay, Pete. Would you consider it unhealthy if I eat a chicken wrap with lettuce, chips, and blue cheese five to five out of seven days, trying to stay at one meal a day, but also supplement my diet with vitamins and multivitamins. Okay. So couple harder. Sounds like this is your one meal a day for five out of seven days. Um, Let me address that first because that's maybe the easier one. I rarely recommend one meal a day fasting, mostly because it is so hard, if not impossible to get all of someone's daily protein needs in. And that's not just... I know that can sound like something unnecessary during the weight loss process. Like, oh, do I really need to be getting enough of something during a weight loss process? Yes. (laughs) You, when we're looking at um, weight loss, we need to be getting a protein. There's actually been multiple studies. I think I'm talking about them coming up 
in a couple of videos, but one recent one showing that actually a higher protein intake does a better job than just typical calorie restriction for having long-term weight loss goals, better at reducing body fat, better at maintaining muscle mass. So you really want to make sure you're getting enough protein. Eating one meal a day can make it very hard because protein is so satiating. So you want to watch out for that. Um, I at most recommend like a two meal a day. That can be good for some people. Even that can be a little iffy, but one meal a day I found maybe works for 1% of people. And if it works for you, fantastic. Not saying it's unhealthy, but it is just very hard to do right. Now, the other part of the chicken wrap with lettuce, um, chips, and blue cheese, uh, the chicken and blue cheese and lettuce, great. Um, the wrap component, and I'm not sure if your goal is weight loss necessarily, if it's gut health, you know, this could be a little different, but um, my concern is, first of all, it doesn't sound like enough protein for one meal a day. Uh, you do have great high quality protein sources with the chicken and the blue cheese. But then you also have things like chips and the wrap that are very high glycemic, uh, can cause a big blood sugar spike and fall can make the fast a lot more difficult if you were to be incorporating the fast after this. So this is not something I'd recommend for one meal a day at all. Um, you know, there are ways to do it. I like to have wraps using like coconut wraps or um, like the cauliflower wraps, egg wraps, a lot of other great options that also are going to add in some protein there too. But the chips component that brings us back to the trans fats issue and the liver scarring, just especially having that on a daily basis is not something I'd recommend. Maybe like on the weekend as a treat, if it's part of your treat meal, okay, if that's something you love. But otherwise, there's just so many better options that you could be that are more nutrient dense that you could replace that with, where then you wouldn't also need to supplement your diet with vitamins and multivitamins because you're getting it from your food. So a couple things to think about there. Um, but I do have, what was the video I was just going to recommend? But I have a video coming out soon about wraps and um, lower carb higher protein options that are much better coming soon. So if you are not subscribed, make sure that you are so you don't miss that one because that's going to be a really, really great one for you. Otherwise, do make sure you check out my video on OMAD or if you are going to do OMAD one meal a day, the best types of foods to eat. I have like a full video on the five best foods to eat with one meal a day. Really recommend you check that out. Okay. Terry, I have your unflavored protein powder. It's great. Well, thank you. Uh, what are some other fat sources that are great to use in smoothies other than coconut butter? Some of my favorites are chia seeds and flax seeds because you also get some really great sources of fiber in there too. Um, you could even throw avocado in there. And if you have like, like a Costco, they sell the frozen, the bags of frozen chunks of avocado. So that's a great one if you like your smoothies really thick. I actually don't like my smoothies super thick, so I tend to stay away from that. But if you like them really thick, great way to get both fat and fiber in. Um, but chia seeds, avocado, um, hemp seeds, flax seeds, really any of the seeds are great options, but especially the hemp, flax, and chia. Uh, nut butters are also great. I think people thought that I like hate peanut butter because of the video I came out talking about how peanut butter isn't a protein. Um, but peanut butter is a great source of fat. It's just not really... A protein source. So it's another option you could add into smoothies for a fat option. Okay. I think I actually, oh, thank you, Laura. Woohoo, six months. Yeah, almost there. <laughs> um, well, guys, if you guys want to join in on the detox week that's starting today and um, join the A and peeps who are participating today, do it with the group. You can grab the details for the seven day detox program linked down description below. Otherwise, this has been a really fun live stream, actually. I've loved all the questions, so thank you guys for tuning in. Um, and we do have another really great summer challenge coming up very soon. So many fun, exciting things for that. Oh my gosh, I've been working on this one for like the last seven or eight months. So really, really excited for that coming up. If you aren't subscribed to my weekly newsletter, make sure that you are so that you can get the updates for when that summer challenge is coming up. Uh, you can go onto my website. I actually think I also have the newsletter linked down in the description below as well if you just scroll through the different links and resources on there. But you can find it at autumn l so autumn e l l e nutrition.com and then just go to the free newsletter tab. I don't spam you. It's like once a week that I come out with just good solid nutrition information and tips plus announcements on upcoming challenges. So I have one coming up very soon 
you guys are going to love. I'm so excited about. But for now, if you guys want to join in, make sure you check out the link in the description below for a seven-day detox. Otherwise, have a great detox week, guys, and 